Matthew 16, we're going to start reading in verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13. And it says, uh, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now there's a lot in here. There's numerous subjects I could preach on in here. I'm not going to dwell on many of them this morning. Uh, I've noticed a disturbing trend lately, and not just here, but I mean not just like here in Erlon or in our area, <coughs> excuse me, but uh, really the whole country. And that is of Christians thinking that it's their place to question every doctrine in the Bible, even some of the most plain, simple, foundational doctrines of Christianity, uh, as though each one really is optional for them, whether they'll follow, follow it or whether they won't. Uh, now certainly there's a place for discussion over issues of some of the more deeper, uh, more difficult things in Scripture. Uh, there are areas that we can discuss whether it's this or that, and, and, and that's all okay, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean really basic things, and not only questioning them, but without even questioning them, just outright rejecting them and dismissing them as having no import, and even sometimes calling them the things of the devil. Uh, now look again at the verses here in uh, verse 18. And it says, And I will say unto thee, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this is the first place where Jesus begins to talk about his church. Now many believe that this is actually the place where the church officially began. And there's some disagreements and some discussion, and that's fine. I don't think it's really a major issue as to trying to pinpoint exactly at what point the church began. Personally, I believe the church began when Christ called his first disciple to himself, because a church is a called out assembly. And as soon as people began to be called to him and assemble in his name, that's a church. But I may be wrong. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not arguing that point. Uh, and it's not really that important a point, but what is important is that there is a church. And Jesus calls it here, my church. It is his church. Now, just a real brief word on the term church here, just so that uh, we don't have any, any misunderstanding. Uh, the term church, which again means a, 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 a called out assembly, and in context, it would be a called out assembly of born again baptized believers in Christ. Uh, but it's also a term which really has a, a non Christian related term to it, which just refers to an, a, a, an official assembly. Like we might think of when we go to a town hall meeting with, uh, uh, with Tom Hammond. Okay? That would fit the same meaning as the general term ecclesia which is an, an assembly, it's an official assembly of people called to a meeting and it's got leadership and it's got a plan, a uh, goal in mind and, and so an official meeting would be ecclesia, the same thing. But in our case, it is a called out assembly of believers. Now the term really is used kind of in two ways in scripture. Uh, and there will be argument on that. People, if, if anybody actually watches the video, there will be people who will probably argue with me on this. But uh, some of them, and I believe what Jesus talks about here, is in a very general term, the word 
word church would refer to uh, the entire body of believers. All believers of all time, past, present, future. Uh, everybody who is born again in Jesus Christ is part of the church. But I also don't believe that that church will be fully realized until such time as all believers of all time are assembled together. <clears throat> because there again is the term, there is the meaning of that term, an assembly of called out believers. So uh, you got to be assembled. If you're not assembled, you're not a church. Uh, we are a church because we are assembled. Now, we may not all be assembled, but some of us are assembled here together as the church, and that's what makes us the church. The building is not the church. Uh, so then also, another meaning of the word is, is the word church, which is the local New Testament church. Okay, one is a general of all, the, all, all believers. The other is the local church, which is like what we are, which is like what they are over there. Um, the local, a local body of believers, like-minded believers, joining together under leadership of a pastor, and uh, which is under the leadership of the Lord. And I believe about 90% of the references in the Bible to the church is pointing to that local church. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so again, simply it's a body of like-minded, scripturally baptized believers that regularly assemble together for service, for teaching, for preaching, and for fellowship. The ministries go forth from the local churches. Uh, missions, evangelism, witnessing, all of these types of things are all aspects of the local church. There's really no biblical precedent for ministries being born from outside of a church. When we have some, uh, uh, when we see the, uh, what they call parachurch organizations, which are religious organizations, but they're not really a church, but they're sort of church related, but they don't call themselves that. Um, there's no real biblical precedent for that. Any ministries like that should go out from under a local church. Uh, even Paul, when he went out witnessing, went out uh, evangelizing as a missionary throughout Asia and those areas, uh, even he went out under the authority of a church, of a local church, the Church of Antioch, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, uh, uh, so that's kind of what, what, what that term church means. So now that we have an understanding, general understanding of the term, we can do a whole lesson on it, we're not going to do that. But I want to talk about the importance of the church, especially of the local church, because again, we are living in a time where even Christians are saying, church ain't a big deal, who cares? There's, there's a group I talked to who actually said that the churches are the enemy of Christ and that they are the work of the devil. And you've got to be really careful with that because the Bible says Jesus himself, when he defined what blasphemy is, he defined blasphemy as, as, as calling the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the devil. And I believe a Bible-believing, a Bible-preaching church is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not the work of the devil. And so when somebody calls it the work of the devil, they are committing blasphemy, and that's the kind of blasphemy that is unforgivable. Be very careful what you call the work of the devil. Because we remember even the church of Laodicea, with all of its problems, still had their candle in place. The Lord still recognized it as his church. Even though they were a mess, Christ still recognized it as his church. So we got to be careful who we're pointing at and calling the work of the devil. That a church may sometimes do the work of the devil is neither here nor there. It may still be the Lord's church if there is a poor group of born-again believers there. So, anyways, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, so there are those who don't believe the church is necessary for Christians, that, that, that the local church has anything to do with it. Just two days ago, I had somebody tell me that there is no such thing, biblically, as a local church. That there is only the church, and that all those local churches are all the work of man, and they're not the work of God. Uh, and with such a belief, that kind of a person, I can guarantee you, has never set foot in the church. Or he has, and at some point he got hurt, he got mad, he got offended, whatever it might be, and he got out and decided, you know what, I don't need a church anymore. So now for many people, their church has become something that they see online, uh, listening to preaching on the radio, listening to some guy on the TV. That's now their church, and, and they're happy with that. 
Um, so this is the growing trend that I'm seeing out there. Churchless Christianity. And that's like Christianity without Christ in many ways. Because what is the church? It is the body of Christ. So what does the Bible say about, about churches? I just want to kind of point out to us this morning the importance that the Bible lays and that the Lord lays on the church. And on the, especially on the local churches. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. <coughs> it says that in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. If he didn't say that, that's just a little side note. Now we're going to stop right there, because I want you to see that the first church, <coughs> after Christ had departed from earth, after he was ascended into heaven, the first church was about 120 people. Now, that's a lot of people. On the one hand, if you look at it from our perspective, I don't know that any church in this town has ever had 120 people. Maybe back when there were babies here, but uh, 120 people, that's a lot of people. But if you think about from the fact that these 120 were assembled by God himself, and that even God could only get 120 faithful followers, it doesn't seem like very much, does it? But still, they were faithful followers, they were true believers, they were disciples. And there was 120, so this is what the starting is for the church. But how do we know that this is the church? The Bible doesn't call them here the church, it just says they're the disciples and the number of the names. So, so how do we know this is the church? Well, uh, look over to uh, chapter 2, verse 37. So this is our starting number, 120. Chapter 2, verse 37. And this is after Peter and the apostles had preached the gospel to the, to the multitudes of people who were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And, uh, and he's, he preached to them about Christ. And this is the results here, verse 37. Now when they heard this about Christ, they were pricked in their hearts. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Say, this is a good thing. They heard the gospel. They said, okay, what do we do with the information? We, we understand it. We believe it. What do we do with it? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord, as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 41, that they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day that were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Added unto who? The 120. But it still doesn't call them a church here, does it? We're still not seeing that. So how do we know this is the church? This is what we consider the church. Well, verse 47 tells us in the same context of what they're doing here. They were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the... What? The church. Added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So now, finally, we see that the 120 to which the 3,000 were added, and the Lord added daily to them, is the church. Okay, now we can say, the pastor, that's the church, right? That's the overall arching, uh, total universal church. Absolutely right. At this point it is, because there is no other church. This is it. This is the local New Testament first church of Jerusalem. But it's the only church, so therefore it is the church, just as Jesus said, I will build my church. But is this the only church that the Lord expected to be made? Is this the only, is there only one church that the Lord planned for there to be? Just Jerusalem. So many people out there say, oh, we need to go back to how they did it in Jerusalem. That's exactly how we ought to be today. That we left I think the Judaistic background of Christianity is wrong. We need to go back. Well, no, Jesus didn't intend for it to stay in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1, going back again to verse 8, we can see that Jesus gave his disciples a charge. And he said this, But ye shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Jesus never intended Christianity to stop in Jerusalem. Okay, so they're going to go to the other parts of the world. What are they going to do there? Let's find out. Look at chapter 11. Saul. 
As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, from the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So here we see now the authority given to the local church by God. Uh, the Lord didn't say, Okay, Saul, Barnabas, I want you guys to go. No, he told the whole group of the leadership there at Antioch, separate Saul and Barnabas and send them out to do the work. So here now we further see the first example of the Lord giving direct authority to the church to send somebody out on a ministry. Saul and Barnabas didn't decide just on their own that they were going to go and be ministers. They were sent out from the local church of Antioch. And they did it by their authority, which was working by God's authority. That's how it's supposed to be. Uh, the local Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church is given authority from the Lord to perform the ministries of the Lord, just as Saul and Barnabas did here. Uh, so from Acts, we can see that one primary work of the early believers was to go out and preach, start new churches, local churches, set them to be autonomous under local leadership, and go forth do it again. And that's what Saul and Barnabas did, who eventually, of course, we know became Paul. So that's what, that's what they did. That, that was what their calling was, to go and start churches, each individual body being a body of Christ. The local body of Christ with the job to preach the gospel to the local people, get them saved, bring them into the local church, and make them a part of that work. Now, the second fact that we see on the high position of the local churches, the second proof we have, was the fact that most of the New Testament was written to local New Testament churches. It was written to them. It wasn't written to some guy. It, they didn't say, you know, to, to, to St. Bob, pass it around to whoever you see. It was written to a church. There was a, a letter written to the church at Rome. There was a letter written, there was two letters written to the church at Corinth. There was a letter to the church at Ephesus. The church, the, the church is of Galatia because already this early there was more than one local church in Galatia. So it was sent to the churches in Galatia. We sent to one and then to the other as well. Uh, there was the church at Colossae, the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica. Each one of them was sent a letter, an epistle, and each of these epistles, after it went to that church, would be sent around to the other churches and they all exchanged it and they all began to compile all of them together to bring us the Bible. Um, after that, we know that Paul wrote letters, epistles, if you will, that's what that word means, epistle is a letter. He wrote an epistle to, or he wrote two epistles to Timothy, who was a young preacher, and one to Titus, who was also a preacher, to instruct them on how to run the churches, on how to be godly pastors. That was the point of those letters, how to preach. Um, and, uh, and how do we know again that a church is a local uh, is a local house of God, if you will? We see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and <coughs> verse 14. 1 Timothy 3, 3 and verse 14. You see that Paul says this to him. He says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So here we see that now the church, the local church, because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the church which Timothy is going to be pastoring. So, so we know it's a local church, not the overall Archie church. He calls it, number one, the house of God. Folks, we are the house of God. We've got to get that to our understanding. The church, the local church, is the local house of God. That's how the Lord sees it. We are His house. It also says that we are the pillar and the ground of the truth. So we not only, like a pillar, uphold the truth, but like the ground, the pillar is set on the ground and is the foundation holding up that which is holding up the, the, the truth. We are the place from which the truth flows. The church, the house of God. 
It's an important thing in the eyes of God that he would call it that. This was much of what Paul wrote to Timothy and to Titus. He said, pass on these things as her pastor. Okay? Uh, uh, teach these things to godly men, faithful men, who will teach them on after you. That's not a direct quote. Okay? Sorry, that's what you get. Uh, and then, of course, we also have the fact that the second and third chapters of Revelation were completely written to who? You remember what the second and third chapters of Revelation were written to? Specifically directed to? Seven churches of Asia. Exactly. The seven churches of Asia. And each church was identified by name. Their character, their spiritual character, their spiritual condition is described. Each one very different from the other. They're good and they're bad. And each one is given a charge. Each one was a local New Testament church. And each one was expected to maintain some level of godliness that the Lord expected. And even one of the best ones with the most good said about it, the Lord said, but you, 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 you're missing one thing. You've left, you, you've left your first love. And if you don't get back right, I'm going to take your candle out of this place. You don't repent and do the first works, which is loving God. And this is why many churches fail, because they get so involved in the, the work and the churchiness of everything, and the lots of things going on, and the programs and all these things, they forget to love God. They forget the reason they do it. The long going ministry. Huh? The long going ministry. Long going ministry. Well, yeah, you see, you get caught up in a lot of that. That's one of the ministries they had next door. The long going ministry. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, but, uh, you know, it's not really a ministry unless you're out there giving the gospel. You know, the gospel's got to be associated with all of our ministries. It's not, a church is not a charity. That's not what we're here for. We're here to give the gospel. So clearly the Bible, and therefore the Lord, upholds the local New Testament church as being very important and vital in the life of believers. In Acts, we can see where people sold all that they had and laid it at the apostles' feet to distribute as needed to help the church. We see churches who gathered finances to use for the help for, for the needs of other needy churches, and even for Paul and his fellows in their travels. People joined churches. They risked death to be part of a local church. And then to this day, there are places where people risk dying, risk arrest and dying, uh, from, a, from a, 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 an evil government just so they can be in a church and hear the word of God preached. They gave of themselves, of their goods, of their time, of their treasure, their talents for the furtherance of the Lord's churches, their church and other churches. Yet today we have a new breed of rebellious Christians who scoff at the very idea that any church is needed or important in the life of a Christian. They even mock the idea of being a part of a local church. They mock it. And many who do believe in the local church have become careless about it, give little of their own time, none of their treasure, none of their talents, so that it might grow and glorify God. But that's not what we see in Scripture. In Scripture, the church became their life. Today, there's a little worry about it. And there are other issues I know. You know, that's part of what I see happening next door. That's part of what's happening there. People aren't wanting to really be a part. They want to go, in some cases, but they don't want to grow. And this is one of our big issues here. And that's the fault of the church as a whole. Not just the leadership, but the leadership is, 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 is at fault, but so is the whole church. And that's the problem I've seen happening over here. And that's the problem I've seen happening here. We're not going out and spreading the seed. We're not going out and giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a problem. And I, and I said earlier that, 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 that I came to the crux of the problem of why they're closing and why none of our churches are growing. Because you, 
You can't expect something to grow unless you water it. You know, you can't expect to have a harvest. If you grow a garden one year, you have a wonderful garden, and you work hard, you make just have a wonderful, great growth, and you have a, a, a great harvest of whatever you've grown. The next year, you can't just sit back and expect it to all do it itself again. You've got to put the same work into it again. If you want to have your tomatoes, you've got to plant your tomatoes and, and fertilize your tomatoes and water your tomatoes so that one day you can harvest those tomatoes. And you certainly don't want to plant them and water them and let them rot on the vine. You've got to go out and do the work of harvesting them as well. And it's the same thing with the church. There can't be a harvest if the seed isn't spread. There can't be a harvest if the seed isn't watered. There can't be a harvest if the harvest isn't gathered. And that's what a church is supposed to do. That's why they're dying. That's why they're dying. And folks, that's why we're dying. Now, the difference is that neither of them believe at their own. I'm not, I'm not trying to talk bad about it. Don't get me wrong. But this is just what I've heard from those there. Is that they don't believe it's their job to do that. They believe that if they open the door and they preach the gospel, that God will just send the people in. And sometimes he might. But in general, that's not the Bible example that we have. But the difference is that we believe we're supposed to do that. But are we doing it? We must plant. We must water. Or we will not harvest. Whether we believe it or not, Herlock and Doyle are fertile ground for the seed of the gospel. Fertile ground. And I want you to understand, we're few. And I know it sounds like I'm beating you guys up. But there's only us. There's only us. They're not doing it. They've already said they're not going to do it. And the proof of them not doing it, we're seeing now. I don't mean to be hard on us, but we're it. But here's the good thing. Every church starts with one man with a vision from God. Every church starts with one man with a vision from God. And then he's got to take that vision to his wife and convince her that this is of God. Now, Delia married me while we were already in, so I didn't have to convince her. But many times, a pastor is maybe even newly married, a young man, and the Lord puts on his heart, go start a church. And then he's got to convince his wife, which might be the hardest one to convince, because she doesn't know where they're going to go. She's maybe gotten settled in, got a nice place, got something good going on, and she's going to watch it all go away. So she's going to be hard to convince. But once she's on board... Now you've got two. And what does the Bible say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there are my I am mixed. Now the Lord's really involved in this because we got two. So those two go, and they go to a place, and they begin to spread the word. Pass tracts, knock some doors, talk to some people, uh, meet them in the stores, have them attract at the cashier, wherever you might be. And pretty soon there's three people. And then maybe there's four people. And then maybe there's six, and maybe there's ten. But it always starts with one. So do not think ever that I'm saying, Debbie, it's your job to go do this. Andrew, it's your job. It's all of our job. It's her job and your job and your job and my job. And his job is not here. And his job is not here. I'm pointing there because that would be your husband because it should be sitting next to you. Uh, it's, it's all of our job. But we won't harvest if we don't plant if we don't water. So the question, the challenge that we have then, and I'm going to end with this, is will we make the work of God in His house, in His church, and its growth so that Jesus might be glorified our priority or will we follow suit, shut the doors, walk away and say, not my problem. Because these are the only two options we have. We can die on the vine, or we can go forth and plant the seed and water the seed. And I'm not saying you have to go to every door and knock every door. 
You know, there's so many different ways we can give the gospel. We can hand somebody a tract. We have a whole pile of tracts back there. Bring some tracts for them to work. Hand them to somebody. Put them in the restrooms. Leave them laying around. It doesn't matter. Talk to somebody. We got to do it. Or we're going to be no different from them. And we're going to be gone. You know, there's plenty of other churches we can go to, but God's called us here. We live here. This is our home. We should have a heart for those who are our home. I have a heart here. I'm going to try to stick it out. But these are our only options. Go to the harvest or shut it down. That's it. There's, there's no in between. We have to decide. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as I pray, or as, I, as I speak today, Father, oh Lord, I don't want anybody feeling like I'm trying to lay an unnecessary load upon their shoulders. Lord, I know there's only a few of us here today. And Father, at best, there's generally only a few of us here today. And Lord, I know that much of the weight must fall on my shoulders to lead. And I, and, and I try to do that, Father. But as a church, Lord, we need to take up this responsibility, Father. We either need to see it as being that important, Father, or just, or just walk away and see who's not important, Father. But according to your word, I see that the church is the greatest thing that you've given man. Heavenly Father, I just ask, O oh God, that you would use us. That you would make us bold. That you would give us a heart for your work and for our neighbors and for our loved ones here in this area, Father. And even if they get saved and go somewhere else, Lord, well, bless God for them. If they're saved and going to heaven, Lord God, then, 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 then so be it. But Lord, we would love to see it here as well. Father, give us the harvest more, but give us the pure seed. And give us the, the energy and the, and the desire and boldness to spread that seed of your gospel. And let us see a great harvest from that, Lord, come to fruition. And Lord, again, I, let nobody here think that I'm, I'm overly pressuring them. Lord, if I had a church with a hundred people, it would be so much easier because that, that, that burden could be spread abroad. Lord, as I said, we're, we're just like a new church here, Father. Just, there's just a few. But Lord, let us all catch that vision that we might grow and we might, Father, spread the word. We might glorify you, our Savior, in our lives, Father. Lord, I, I'm sorry to see the, 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 the church over here, Lord, the things I talk about. I'm not trying to speak ill of them, Father, not in any way. But we must learn from those who go before us whether through their successes or their failures, we have to learn by that example, Lord God, and try to do differently. So, Father, we just lift this church up to you, Father. We lift this little body, this, this, this local body of Christ up before you, Lord God, and let it be a glorification in thy eyes, Lord, and save the souls and bring them to you. And, Lord, use me Help me to get out, Father. Let me not keep finding things to get in the way uh, when I have to be going out, Lord. Father, it's so easy to have a hundred different things going on where I just got to go here and I got to go there. Lord, and I, and I repent of that and I ask your forgiveness for it, Father, because I'm certainly not perfect in any of this. The buck kind of stops with me, and I understand that, Lord, and I'm sorry. And I pray, Lord God, that I would be more faithful. And I pray, Lord, as I am faithful, Father, that others would follow as well, and that you would bless that faithfulness, Lord God. And bring the people in, save the souls, get our hearts guided toward thee. And Lord, let every one of us who are apart now, Lord, be truly faithful unto you and to your work here, Father. And I just thank you for it. Lord, bless us as we grow our ways today, Father. Bring us together again tonight. And we give you all the praise and glory for it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.